Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, you are tuned in to the uh, first Friday astronomy event hosted by Boise State Physics. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm a professor in the physics department here at Boise State. Uh, the first Friday astronomy events, these are hosted on the first Friday of every month. And so this is the first Friday of May. So we're having one now. Uh, the first Friday events uh, in the summer start at 8.30. And that makes sense in the summer because usually after these events, we go up to the observatory and do stargazing. Of course, we, we can't do that now with the, um, the in-person meetings uh, being uh, not allowed. So, uh, but we're gonna continue to have the, the summer uh, lectures beginning at 8.30 just to keep up continuity. And, and it's not impossible that later in the summer, we'll be allowed to have these in-person meetings again. Um, I wanted to uh, let you all know that we have meeting, we have lectures scheduled throughout the summer. And so these talks, in spite of the fact that school is closed at Boise State, we will continue to have these lectures. So we have one, of course, tonight. We'll have one in June, July, August. And so keep an eye out for announcements about those. Uh, I'll post those on my Twitter feed, on the website, and then the uh, Boise State will also send those out as newsletters. Um, these events are entirely supported by donations from, from you folks. Uh, the Boise State supporters pay for all of this. Uh, they pay for our, our guests to fly out when they do fly out, the, the room and board, they pay for our student volunteers. All of that is, is totally supported by donations from you. Um, if this is a, a program that you really enjoy and you have the ability, uh, I invite you to donate. Uh, you can visit give.boisestate.edu slash astronomy. So give that's boisestate.edu slash astronomy. And that's where you can make donations to support this program. Uh, we recently ran a, a campaign focused on raising funds to purchase a uh, planetarium, an inflatable planetarium that we could take around the, the state and do uh, public events with. And I'm very happy to say that we have raised sufficient funds to do that. You can see here, this is the dome that we're, this is uh, very close to the dome that we're gonna purchase for that uh, effort. And so thank you very much for all of your support. Uh, we raised almost $30,000 to purchase this dome and the projector and hardware that we need in order to, to build a, a mobile planetarium. And so once we can, again, hold in-person meetings, this will be uh, a facility that we can use to host star parties, even when it's cloudy. Great. Um, as you, Notice we are hosting this event on, on YouTube, uh, a YouTube live stream right now. Um, if you have questions that you would like to ask the speaker, I invite you to ask those questions in the, the chat feature on the right-hand side of the, of the YouTube stream. And I will I'll record all those questions and I'm gonna ask those questions to the speaker at the end of the presentation. So you'll have a chance to have your questions relayed. Uh, this, this, the way of, of relating the uh, questions this, this way helps us to manage the crowd a little bit. Okay, uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Kelsey Crafton. There she is. Uh, Dr. Kel Dr. Crafton earned her PhD uh, in physics from Louisiana State University, uh, where she did a thesis on uh, the uh, circumstellar uh, medium uh, generated by supernovae. And she is currently the uh, John N. Bacall Public Policy Fellow for the American Astronomical Society based in Washington, DC. Uh, and with that, uh, Dr. Crafton, I'll turn it over to you and tell us about space science policy. Thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. So I am, uh, as you just said, the uh, Bacall Public Policy Fellow for the American Astronomical Society. Um, that means that I kind of have like a science communications job, except instead of going between scientists and non-scientists, I go between scientists and the government. And I'm specifically trying to help out scientists who do astronomy, planetary science, and heliophysics. So the American Astronomical Society is a member society for the professional astronomical community, uh, but we also now have a amateur astronomer membership. 
Um, so we're representing those people as well now too. I am part of the public policy department at the AAAS, which consists of myself, the fellow, and also the public policy director, Joel Perriott. And together we do these presentations all around the country uh, at whatever institution requests them, talking about uh, science and space policy as it's happening now, <laughs> which is a very interesting time right now for everything. So I wanna start by saying that um, a lot of people think of universities where many professional astronomers work as being in these special bubbles. Um, there's this ivory tower idea and I'd like to burst that bubble and say that no matter where you work, uh, however lofty the things you study are, um, you are still part of a greater ecosystem uh, that's happening around you in this country and in the world. And whether you're paying attention to it or not, it's going to impact you. So I'm just gonna lay out some examples of ways that what the government does directly impacts scientists. So the government creates the budgets for the government agencies, things like NASA. And uh, while doing those budgets, they might decide to not fund part of that agency. So a recent example is, um, in the president's budget request, uh, they didn't give any money to NASA's STEM education office. Um, another example is government regulations. So uh, something we're having to deal with right now is um, sharing of the spectrum. So your cell phone, uh, and any other kind of electronic device is probably giving off radio signals. And we also use the radio spectrum for science. So we have to very carefully divvy that up so that there's room for the scientists and also room for your cell phones and also room for the military. Um, another thing that the government does is authorize the agencies. So in addition to giving NASA money, they also tell NASA what to do. So authorizations come from Congress and they're usually done on for one year at a time, but it tends to be more than one year between authorizations and until an agency gets a new authorization, they just keep acting on their previous authorization. So hopefully this year we'll be getting a new authorization for NASA that's updated with all the exciting new science and other priorities for them to work on. Uh, and another example of an action from the government that can impact science is executive orders. So these come directly from the president and as soon as he signs it, it's law. Um, so there was uh, an executive order uh, requiring the elimination of one third of all advisory committees. Um, so advisory committees in, in the instance that's relevant to science is when the government basically assembles a panel of experts, scientists, to advise them on how they're doing in relation to our field. Um, so this is very important because this is a way that scientists can directly communicate to the government what science is doing and what we need to keep doing our science. Um, this is not a new thing. These executive orders trying to eliminate these advisory committees happen every few presidencies, um, but we really do need them when it comes to science because a lot of people in government are not scientists, so they need the scientists' help. Um, so I've been talking about a lot of people in government and I wanna give some, some names who are the key players so there is uh, the White House, also known as the administration. So this consists of the president and the vice president and all the people who work directly underneath them, which is actually quite a lot of people. Um, so for instance, they have an Office of Science and Technology Policy. They have the Office of Management and Budget, which is where the president's budget comes from. It's actually a whole building 
full of expert people working out the numbers to see like how can our country get by while trying to save as much money as possible and still following through on the president's priorities. Other policymakers include um, our elected representatives. So in this case, I'm talking about our congressional representatives and our senators. Um, and then there's the people who work for them who are called staffers. So in, in an individual representative or senator's office, there will be a set of staff that works for them. And usually there's one staffer that covers all of science for them, including a bunch of other topics. So that person is stretched pretty thin and they're usually not actually a scientist. There are also uh, congressional committees and those committees have their own staff. And so if you have a, sci a congressional science committee, the staff for that committee will usually be scientists. They will have a PhD or something like that and they will be uh, an expert in, in the field that they're advising the committee on. And then we have the government agencies, which I mentioned before. So an example would be NASA. Another example is the National Science Foundation. There's the Department of Energy. Those are just three of the agencies that, uh, given that we represent the astronomers and astronomical sciences, those are the agencies we tend to interact with. So those agencies have lots of administrative personnel making sure that everything runs smoothly, all their projects are getting done. So those people are essentially by enacting the policies they're directed to do, they are like policymakers. And then there are these advisory groups or advisory committees. So by advising the agencies on what to do, uh, they are also impacting policy, even though they're regular scientists that just got this side job sitting on this uh, advisory panel. So I'm gonna take a closer look at the agencies. The three big ones for the astronomical sciences are NASA, the National Science Foundation, also known as NSF, and the Department of Energy, also known as DOE. Within NASA, there is the Science Mission Directorate. So all the human exploration stuff happens in a different directorate of NASA, and they have an entire directorate just for their science missions. So things like Hubble Space Telescope. There is also the Office of STEM Education at NASA, which I mentioned earlier. At NSF, there's uh, basically a bunch of different scientific branches within NSF. So MPS stands for the Mathematical and Physical Sciences, which astronomy would be under. MREFC is for our major research equipment and facilities construction. So all the tele big telescopes that are here on Earth, not up in space, uh, these are dominantly uh, run, created and run by NSF. And then there is HRD, which is Human Resources Development. So this is more the people side and less the science and facility side of the National Science Foundation, which is important because the National Science Foundation uh, gives out a lot of grants that fund many of the scientists and their students. The Department of Energy has a Department of High Energy Physics, and within that is the Cosmic Frontiers Division, which is where a lot of astronomical science research and projects are done. So now that I've talked about the government and its structure, um, a really important part of my job is interacting with the budget cycle because we won't have professional astronomers if none of them are getting paid. And a lot of them, because they're doing basic research, rely on money from the government, especially through those agencies I just talked about. So it's very important that we have people here in DC advocating on their behalf because there's a limited amount of money and everybody wants some. So we need to make sure there's a voice asking for some for the astronomical sciences. So this is an outline of the federal budget process. It's on an annual cycle. 
So I have the calendar years, which are just your regular 2019, 2020, 2021. They start in January, they end in December. The fiscal years, which are still one year long, do not match the, the calendar year cycle. So the fiscal year starts in, on October 1st and ends just before October 1st. So I've drawn an arrow to show where we are in the calendar year in the fiscal year. While time is passing by, the whole government is working very hard to decide how we're going to be spending our money, how we're going to function as a country. So all in the, in the light blue is uh, agencies working each year to determine what their agency is going to need to function. So they're hearing all this input from the scientific community about what projects we wanna do, and they need to figure out how they're gonna budget all the money for those projects. Once the agencies have thought about that, they send it off to the Office of Management and Budget, which is part of the administration. Uh, so they work for the president and the Office of Management and Budget works with the agencies to create the presidential budget request. So that's that red bar there. The president's budget is released in February, usually that did happen this year. So that basically outlines the president's vision for the country taken and then put through this giant process of how do we make this a reality given our limited resources. Then it's Congress's turn. So the president does not get the final say on the budget. Uh, once the president's budget is released, then Congress gets to take a swing at it. So the first thing they do is pass a budget resolution, which says, what is the total like highest number, total number uh, for money that we're going to spend in the next fiscal year. And then once they have that, then they break it down into 12 pieces and they have a bill for each piece. So for one of the pieces might be uh, the uh, appropriation subcommittee for commerce, justice, and science. <laughs> So, so science is in the same piece as all of commerce and all of our justice system. And they need to figure out this one subcommittee of Congress needs to figure out how they're gonna fund these three hugely important things. And then what we saw last year was something called a continuing resolution. So you might see the purple boxes that have appeared under 2019. Uh, we had two continuing resolutions. That's when the government was not able to decide what they were going to do for next year by the end of the previous year. So instead of the whole thing just shutting down, they pass a continuing resolution which says we're just going to keep our numbers from 2019 until we come up with our numbers for 2020 because Congress has to agree on what those numbers should be and pass them. And that's a huge amount of work. So if you look at the money that we've been spending over time, um, there's mandatory spending, which covers things like social security and defense. And then there's discretionary spending, uh, which all of science is gonna fall under discretionary, non-defense discretionary, uh, specifically is where most astronomers are gonna be getting their money from. So if you look at it as a percentage of our GDP over time, it looks like it's going down. But if you were to see it in the total, total dollar amount, it's still going up that light blue discretionary line. So we're pulling from that amount of money. And then if you break down research and development by how much is the federal government contributing versus how much is private industry contributing, how much are universities, which are big research centers contributing, and how much is coming from a combination of other sources. Uh, you see that for basic research, the federal government is the biggest backer. And so that is why my job 
making sure that the federal government knows what science needs to be funded is so important because if you're a scientist, it's very, very likely, especially in the astronomical sciences, that you're going to be needing to get money from the federal government to do your research. Um, universities also cover a pretty large piece of the pie for basic research. Um, and then industry takes over when it gets to applied research and development because there's much lower risk and they know what the end put output should be. But basic research is very high risk, but also high reward. So that's why we need the federal government because it's too, it's, it's very risky for businesses to invest in basic research. And then if we break it down by the different types of sciences and research that get funded, um, you can see in blue at the top health has seen a very large increase in funding since the 70s, which is uh, very relevant to what's happening right now. Um, space was receiving lots of money uh, around Apollo and uh, has since uh, not received ever quite so much funding. Um, and you can also see um, energy and uh, there's a couple other science categories there. So if we, if we look at each agency's budgets, uh, we see we get a bit more information when we look at an individual agency. So here I have some numbers for NASA science. So remember how I said human exploration was separate from the science mission directorate? So this is not all of NASA. This is just the part of NASA that does science. So their total budget for fiscal year 2020 was just over $7 billion. In yellow, we have the uh, presidential budget requests relative to the previous year. So what were they proposing, an increase or a decrease? So here we can see uh, that the presidential budget request was uh, proposing lots of decreases, and that's pretty typical for a presidential budget request, they're usually trying to save money. That's OMB's, the Office of Management and Budget's job. Um, and then we can see in blue and red is House and Senate respectively. And they tend to give money back, although sometimes they, they can still cut. Um, but it's important to note that they don't necessarily agree with what the president proposed. So the president's budget request comes out in February and Congress can just completely change the whole thing before they pass any uh, appropriations into law. So, and then we see the final amounts are in black because we're currently in FY20. So we know how much got appropriated to us this year. Um, and those don't necessarily have to agree with just the House or just the Senate. And they don't necessarily have to be a average of the two numbers that got proposed. There's a lot of back and forth during this process over how these numbers should end up. And here's an example from the National Science Foundation, again, for this year, fiscal year 2020. Um, you can see that for the first three categories, uh, the um, the presidential budget requests asked for cuts and Congress gave them bumps. But for the last category, uh, everyone agreed to cut this category. And that's because this is the category that builds the large telescopes. So as you're building the telescope, you need lots of money. But when you finish building the telescope, you don't need the money anymore. So this budget tends to go up and down quite a bit. So this, this cut is actually not bad for the NSF because it just symbolizes that they were finishing up a very large project and didn't need the money anymore. So Congress and the president's budget request can take it away and put it elsewhere. And then I just wanted to put up the Department of Energy's numbers to round out the three agencies that we're the most interested in in the astronomical sciences. High energy physics is specifically where we draw our money from. And a 22% cut would have been pretty harsh. Uh, but thankfully, Congress uh, gave us a small boost of 7%. 
And so you're probably wondering, well, if a new budget request came out in February, what, is, what does that look like compared to the year we're in now for science? So um, since they're trying to save money, it's lots of cuts uh, across the board. Only a couple um, agencies uh, got some boosts, mostly having to do with defense, uh, Department of Defense, it's DOD, DOE Nuclear Security, um, so it'll be interesting to see what Congress does with these numbers in the next couple months. So now that we've talked about the fact that scientists need money from the government and there's limited resources and everyone wants a piece of this pie, um, I need to talk about why would the government give us any money <laughs> if it's so competitive, uh, even though we rely on it so much. And a lot of that has to do with public opinion. So uh, the taxes that come from the public are what are used to pay for all the things the government does, including those agency budgets. And that's where the scientists get all our missions and facilities, our, our grants that pay our salaries and let us have students and teach them science and how to do research and it pays for the continuing operations and the infrastructure to do our research. So those taxes need to come from the public. Uh, we, need to, we need to give the public something so that they want to support us. Um, so part of that is through activities like this, outreach and engagement. Another part of that is education. That's a very big part of that. And another part is job opportunities. So, if you're in a district and the district next to you has a NASA center, your district might, even though it doesn't have the NASA center, might contain a manufacturing plant that sends lots of products over to that NASA center. So that NASA center is creating job opportunities in your district. And that means, uh, that your representative for your district recognizing that you're getting a job because of that center will support that agency, even though they're not necessarily located in their district, they're still providing job opportunities. And overall, uh, the science polls very well in general um, among non-scientists in the public. Uh, also space does very well um, so Americans' confidence in scientists has been increasing in recent years. Um, it's been shown that uh, there is, uh, it is considered a uh, important or top priority for us to conduct basic scientific research um, to increase our knowledge of space. And NASA is pretty much always <laughs> very popular. And also not just that they support us doing our research and, uh, and trust our judgment, but they think that uh, our, our science should be relevant to policy. So uh, many people who responded to this poll felt that scientists should be engaging with elected officials and the public. So that's pretty much my job. And uh, they also felt that public policies should be based on science. And there was broad support for uh, funding basic science. And there was also support in funding engineering and technology, which there's a lot of overlap between basic science and engineering and technology. Okay, well, how does that translate <laughs> How does public opinion translate to uh, the government's opinion? Because really they get the final say in whether we get any money and can continue to do our research or not. So uh, there's been some big changes regarding science in the government recently. Uh, in the last couple of years, there have definitely been some major shifts in attitude towards climate change in Congress as more and more people's states and districts are directly impacted. Um, Almost everyone is acknowledging that it's happening. Uh, now we're just arguing about why it's happening. <laughs> so who, who, who or what is to blame? 
uh, but that's fine because at least we're having a conversation now. There's also a lot of interest in space in government right now, mostly because of commercial and military prospects. So not necessarily the science, but that's okay. Uh, and the current Congress is very supportive of uh, STEM education right now, which for those of you who don't know, uh, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And um, there has been a recent movement to also add the arts for a well-rounded education, changing the acronym to STEAM. Um, but at the very least, uh, they recognize that this will be necessary for the next generation of workers to have some kind of basic STEM education. A skilled technical workforce is the term that they're using. Um, building on that, uh, the priorities of the administration are, are constantly changing and Congress's budgets don't necessarily even agree with those priorities. So there's, from the scientist's point of view, look at, trying to look into this process, it can seem pretty chaotic. Um, but I, I try to encourage scientists not to worry too much because our current Congress, uh, the science committees who make the decisions for us, um, have very strong bipartisan support for science. So that's a great sign. Since this is a presentation about how things are going right now, I do have to mention that a lot of attention is obviously being given to the pandemic. Um, but Congress is continuing with that regular appropriations fiscal year cycle uh, while also working on these stimulus packages. So all these stimulus packages, these happen outside of that regular cycle. So those are all on top of our normal spending. So with regards to space policy specifically, uh, there have some, been some big changes in the last couple of years. There's Space Command, Space Force, and Space Commerce, and they are all here and likely here to stay. Um, actually, our community finds space commerce very useful because we're having to interact with, with industry a lot more, the satellite industry, and space commerce has been very helpful in facilitating that. Um, they are a, a office within the Department of Commerce, Space Commerce. Uh, the commercialization of space and the rapid growth in that satellite industry is leading to more attention being paid to FCC regulations. So it's pretty rare that they, uh, they go up for reevaluation uh, and receive a lot of attention, but that's happening right now. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and then also obviously human exploration, given that it's been a priority of the president has been a very hot topic in government. Um, so when the House came out, House of Representatives came out with a draft of the NASA authorization last year. Uh, all of the reactions to that draft had to do with the human exploration session and very few people were talking about the science section, except us. <laughs> if you look at the breakdown in Congress, um, you can see that uh, across uh, this economic distribution, there's a clear break but over pretty much everything else, there is a smooth spectrum. And you see that in both the House and the Senate. There's really only a clear break uh, when it comes to economics, but for everything else, there is there's a spectrum among members. So in general, uh, science and engineering enjoy a broad base of support, bipartisan, the public likes it, so the only reason that we are lacking financial support is because other priorities are ranking higher. So where do me and the AAS fit into all of this? Uh, the role of the AAS as a whole, get to me specifically in a second, um, has to do with informing policymakers on what's cool and exciting that's happening in our sciences, and then also advocating for our priorities. So in one case, we're just providing information on what's fun and exciting. In the other case, we're needing to ask them, this telescope really needs to get funded. Can you please make sure 
that there's a line item for it. Uh, and then the other half goes in the opposite direction. So we, we take the information we get from the government and we try to inform our community about anything that's happening in the federal government that might affect our field or our members' ability to do science. And it might come to us having to recommend that the board of the AAS make a statement or resolution aimed at improving the state of the profession or mobilizing the membership. So for instance, government shutdowns are very bad because that means the agencies can't give the scientists the money they need to keep living and working. So the last time we had an action alert for the society was around a shutdown, asking members to contact their representatives to end the shutdown. So we receive lots of input from our community because it's our job to pass that along to the government. So we have many forms of receiving this input. We have three decadal surveys through the National Academies. So the decadal surveys happen once every 10 years, hence their name, and they set the priorities for their respective field for the next 10 years. So there's one for astronomy and astrophysics, one for heliophysics, which is the study of the sun and space weather, and another one for planetary science. In addition to the decadals, there's a mid-decadal uh, for each one of them that, that just gives like a status update. How are we doing progressing on these 10 years, 10 year priorities we set? There are also the advisory committees, which are made up of scientists. The AAS has a committee on astronomy and public policy and we also offer a congressional visits day. So uh, any member of the AAS can become a member of the committee and any member of the AAS can sign up to join us once a year. We give you a training session on how to visit members of Congress and how to speak with them. And we actually take you to the Hill here in DC uh, to practice visiting your members so that you can do that on your own next time. So in addition to that Congressional Visits Day, we also have a policy blog on our website that's regularly <laughs> bi-weekly updated <laughs> with the latest happenings and events. Um, we coordinate between the different divisions of the AAS. So those same three decadals, we have those same three uh, fields within our membership and we try to make sure we're treating them all the same. So when we go to ask Congress uh, to fund the astronomical sciences, we don't give more money to one division over the other. The individual divisions are allowed to ask for things themselves, though, on their own. It's just we have to treat everyone the same. And then we also interact very regularly with those advisory committees sitting in on their meetings so that we can summarize it and post it on our policy blog. And if you want to do a visit to the local office of your representative, we are happy to help you organize that. So what does my job entail as an advocate for the astronomical sciences here in DC? Well, a lot of it has to do with meeting with uh, those congressional staffers, whether they work in an office or on a committee. I also meet with the administration, specifically with the Office of Science and Technology Policy and also that Office of Management and Budget. In fact, the people who work on things like NASA's budget uh, have backgrounds in astronomy. So they, they are experts in the topics they're trying to deal with. Uh, I also go to meetings with people who work at the agencies um, and I can attend the advisory committee meetings. So I get to talk to everybody in my position. I also get to go to the public meetings of the decadal surveys. So the one that's been having a lot of meetings right now is the astronomy and astrophysics one, which is called Astro 2020. Uh, so we've been monitoring that because not everyone is paying close attention, but everyone wants to know what's, what's happening. So we try to relay that and then we also work on separate topics that don't necessarily have to do with any of these different policymakers. And an example of that is the satellite constellation problem, which you can ask me questions about afterwards. 
because it's it's extensive. Um, we also attend coalition meetings and sign letters with coalitions. I'll, I'll go over those on the next slide. And uh, we attend congressional hearings, which are formal events where Congress invites a panel of expert witnesses uh, to come talk to them about a subject so that they are better informed to write laws on it. And we can submit written testimony to those hearings which we've been doing a lot of lately. So the coalitions are when a bunch of organizations like the AAS all get together. And so we can all sign the same letters and send that to Congress and say, look, hundreds of organizations representing tens to hundreds of thousands of Americans all agree on this thing. So we're part of the Task Force on American Innovation, the Coalition for Aerospace and Science, the Coalition for the National Science Foundation, the Energy Sciences Coalition, and we're also part of a publishing coalition. But if I spelled out the initials, it wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't know where they got that name from. <laughs> so uh, what are some of the topics when we, when we go uh, to these coalition meetings or we go talk to staffers? What are some of the things they want to talk about? Well, they want to talk about those decadal surveys because setting priorities for 10 years is a pretty big deal. Um, also, another topic we get asked about a lot has to do with publishing of scientific research and data archives. We deal a lot with that satellite constellation problem and we talk to the government about it. Uh, we also, in um, I mentioned earlier that NASA is getting an authorization this year uh, the National Science Foundation should be as well. So we are talking to Congress about what we think is, a, is good ideas and bad ideas to put into those authorizations, but we're just one voice of many. Um, obviously the budget we work on every year. STEM education is a very popular topic right now. And I am personally very interested in STEM education. So we've been doing a little bit more work on that while I'm the fellow. Uh, space debris is a concern for everyone. Space weather is also a concern for everyone, especially right now when everyone is extremely reliant on internet services. If we had a space weather event that knocked out our communication satellites, everyone would be much more grumpy <laughs> doing their social distancing. And then certainly the pandemic is something that permeates all of our discussions at the moment. So I've, I've mentioned how I'm an advocate and I ask for things, um, but I'm not quite a lobbyist. So a lobbyist goes in and says, I want you to do this for me and here's why. An advocate says, I'm going to provide you information and then open it up for you to ask me questions um, and answer your questions with my opinion based on the organization I work for. So it's less aggressive than a lobbyist. I need to be invited to speak, basically. If you are a private citizen, you never have to worry about being a lobbyist. You only count as a lobbyist if you're paid to do it. So if you're just a private citizen and you want to talk to your representative about anything you want, that's 100% fine. So if you want to do more to engage with the government, um, in-person visits are always the most effective, uh, specifically in-person visits to your representatives. So if, if, uh, if you live in one state and you go to visit a representative uh, from another state, they're probably not going to care very much what you have to say because you're not their constituent. Um, phone calls and emails are fine too. They're just not as good as in-person visits, but in-person visits are sometimes like right now out of the question. Um, it's very important when you are engaging to keep it positive and be very clear about what your message is. And if you want help on how to do these visits, we offer the Congressional Visits Day once a year, which is really a three-day thing because you spend two days training and then one day going to do the visit and we're there with you the whole time. So if your member or senator has not already arrived at a firm decision, 
uh, it's been shown that you visiting them in person as their constituent, it has a big impact on how they feel about something. Um, it's, it's still effective to do letters and email and phone call, but it's the most effective way is, is to do those in-person visits. And once you've done it, you realize it's not hard at all and they seem just like normal people while you're talking to them. So uh, I recommend doing it at some point in your life. So I'm just going to tell you who, who your representatives are. So every state has two senators. For Idaho, you have uh, Senator Mike Rappo, who's been serving you since 1999, and Senator James Reese, who's been serving you since 2009. And you're in the second district if you are co-located with Boise State University. Um, so your representative is Mike Simpson, who's also been serving you a long time since 1999. And Mike Simpson is a member of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Energy and Water Development. So uh, they are the ones who give money to the Department of Energy. So if you're going to talk to them, it's very important to remember keeping it positive, doing no harm. So do not advocate for cutting other science or other projects. Um, only be there to talk about the thing that you like. Uh, don't advocate for partisan solutions, regardless of whose office you're in. Um, and don't present your science if you are a scientist uh, going to do this as an entitlement. Um, make sure you're always very gracious for, for the support that they give us because they don't have to give it to us, um, even though we need it. And uh, do some research before you do your visit. Find out who you're visiting, what are their interests. Um, maybe come up with a personal story that has something to do with what they're interested in. So I just want to end uh, with an ad for our Congressional Visits Day. Obviously, uh, this year it didn't happen because it, it always takes place in the spring. Um, we've postponed it to the fall, but we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic. So uh, fingers crossed that we can still have it in the fall. Um, but next spring, there will be another one. So we, we have you fly out to DC. Uh, we provide you with training on how to do these visits, basically a longer version of this talk. Uh, we bring in members of the government to speak to you, do lots of Q&As, and then we bring you out in groups to visit your representatives. And um, hopefully you take that with you and, and feel comfortable doing it in the future. So I'm happy to see questions now. Great, thanks. That was great, Kelsey. Thanks so much. Um, awesome. I have a couple. Of I have a couple of questions for you. Let me bring them up here. Um, yeah, that's good. That's another good question. Yeah. So, first question I have is: um, Could you share some examples of how the how the U.S. compares to a few other countries in science uh, research spending? And then also, is the government more likely to fund research that is a sure thing versus a long shot? Okay, um, I'll start with the first part, which is how do we compare to other countries? So historically, the US has <laughs> dominated, just completely crushed it in science R&D funding. Um, but a lot of other countries are catching on that that's a pretty effective strategy uh, to put yourself ahead in science and technology globally. So a lot of other countries, um, are, are gearing up and, and especially China. China is set to surpass us possibly even this year in federal R&D spending, um, which is something that Congress is, is very aware of and sensitive to. Uh, so we'll see what happens um, in the upcoming appropriation seasons, uh, how competitive they're feeling. <laughs> and then the other part of the question, um, can you repeat that? Yeah, it's, uh, is the government more likely to fund research that is a sure thing versus a long shot? Right, uh, yes. So there's definitely been a big push by science advocates to remind the government that basic research uh, always has some kind of risk associated with it. And so you have things that really are long shots, very high risk, very high reward 
A good example of that is uh, the gravitational wave detectors. Those took 40 years to build and we didn't even know if they were gonna work, but they did. And when they did, there were Nobel prizes, there were amazing discoveries, new things about the universe. I mean, we, we accomplished something we thought technologically was impossible. So definitely huge rewards on the other end. And the government is aware uh, that they want to fund some projects like that, but they want a diverse R&D portfolio. So they also want some of those basic research projects that have a much lower risk associated with them happen on much shorter time scales, but they're still expecting that they get impressive science out of them. So they're always looking for high reward, but they want a wide range in risk associated with that. Um, there will always be people in government who think we should also continue to fund applied research, but there is a pretty strong argument that since industry funds applied research so heavily, it's not necessary for the government to fund applied research. Um, so what ends up happening is usually there will be a small part of an agency that is dedicated to applied research. Uh, usually it's a startup that couldn't get enough money, but they have a great idea. And so they give the idea to the government to do like a proof of concept for them. And then the startup can take that idea and turn it into a business. The, the Department of Energy is running a program that does exactly that. Yeah, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, we have a question. When will the next decadal occur? So you talk about the astronomy decadal. When will the next one occur? So the astronomy decadal is happening right now. So the report should be out next year in, in 2021. We should have the report outlining our priorities up through 2030. Uh, the planetary one is just getting started. So they're supposed to have their report out in 2023. The heliophysics decadal, they just have their mid decadal. So they still have a uh, ways to go. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, great. And then uh, the last question I have, someone wants to know what your uh, opinion is on these satellite constellations. Yes. Okay. Uh, so our, our department, um, this is a new topic for people who don't know. Uh, historically, satellite companies launch one tens at most 100 satellites at a time. Uh, right now, we're seeing proposals to launch, and, and it's actively happening, launching thousands of satellites into low Earth orbit. So they're close to the Earth. Uh, they're cheaply made because they're made in bulk. So they're not these expensive government stealth satellites. So they are, they are bright. They are very shiny. They're usually just an aluminum box with some solar panels on it meant for communications purposes. So what happens is we have lots of new bright moving targets all across the sky while we're trying to look at it with our big, expensive, very sensitive telescopes. And so when, a, when one of these satellites crosses over one of our high uh, state-of-the-art telescopes, it's going to saturate that telescope. So it's going to burn a strip across the pixels of our camera and mess up that image, which historically that might happen a few times at night and it's okay. You just have to throw out that image, but it didn't happen that often. So it's not a big deal. As we start to see thousands, tens of thousands of these new objects being launched, it's gonna happen a lot more frequently. Um, in fact, the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is uh, the next really big observatory in the US, um, next United States, very big observatory, uh, it has a very wide field of view and it also has a very sensitive camera. So they're looking at losing possibly 10% of all the data that they take, which means they would have to, they initially just wanted to operate for one decade. So now they're gonna have to extend that by a whole year in order to make up for all the data they're losing. And it's very expensive to run these big telescopes. Um, so this was a serious problem uh, and we, we basically need to find a way for these telescopes, for these satellites to not impact the telescopes so heavily. But how do you 
go as a scientist, as an astronomer, how do you go about solving an engineering problem like that? You need to test different kinds of satellites and launch them. Like how would we even begin to do that? That would take us years. And at that point, the sky is full of these things. So thankfully, uh, when we made a ruckus on social media last year, SpaceX reached out to the AAS and the International Astronomical Union and asked us to form a working group to collaborate with them on finding a solution. And so where we're at now is that in June, SpaceX will be launching uh, the latest version of their attempt to get down the brightness of these satellites. They basically put visors on them, little sun shields, uh, so that they don't reflect the sunlight back down to Earth and look so bright. And we're really hoping that works. Um, they've already tried coating their satellites with dark paint. Uh, that did cut the brightness in half, but we really need it down by like a factor of 10. So hopefully these, these new visors work, but they were able to do this on an extremely fast turnaround. They had all their engineers working on this problem. They're doing their, the proof of concept for us for free, which is a huge deal. Um, so collaborating with them has been extremely beneficial for us. Um, and we are hoping that other companies will follow suit. So we're working on a technical workshop that will happen in June. Uh, to come up with a set of metrics and numbers for those metrics so that we can hand other companies numbers to aim for because SpaceX had to do all of this just shooting around in the dark for us <laughs> and other companies are not going to be that kind. Um, so we're going to make it easy for them and we're going to have a follow-up session in August where we come up with a list of policy guidelines, best practices kind of thing. Um, and the AAS is considering doing something like a seal of good housekeeping for, for companies that make an effort for their satellites to not be so intrusive. So we're doing a lot on this effort. A lot of it has to do with um, communicating with an industry that has otherwise been foreign to us. So a lot of educating ourselves on, on how this all works, um, keeping the government up to date on what's happening because we really don't wanna move on lawsuits or regulation unless we absolutely have to because anything like that will take years to do and in the meantime everything is going to get ruined so it's much better to do this the nice way by talking to the industries politely asking them to do things on time scales that are a factor of 10 or 100 shorter than the mean way <laughs> and uh and so far it's working that's great. Okay, I've got one last question for you. Somebody wants to know uh, how involved is the U.S. in the 30-meter telescope and whether the site uh, on Mauna Kea, whether that site is still an issue? So the TMT site, to the best of my knowledge, has not been resolved. Um, the U.S. is is heavily involved with, oh, the U.S. or the AAS? involves with TMT? What was the first part of the question? Uh, no, specifically the US, I guess maybe he okay. meant AAS? Yeah, I guess either. either. Okay, uh, the US definitely involved with the telescope. Um, the AAS, so because we need to treat all branches of astronomy equally, we only ever comment on individual or take a stance on individual projects if they are decadal flagship projects. So when a decadal survey happens, uh, a bunch of scientists submit their ideas for projects to the survey, and then the survey ranks them by what, what should be our top priority and then second, third, et cetera. Those projects are not all the same size. <laughs> Some of them are tens of millions of dollars. Some of them are tens of billions of dollars. Those, those billion dollar plus missions and telescopes are called flagships because they're such a big deal. Um, we only give attention to, to those as an individual project mission telescope. Anything smaller than that, we don't take a stance on because it's not enough to bring us to advocate to Congress or the administration directly. Um, 
I believe a few months ago, the president of the AAS issued a statement, but because there haven't been any major recent developments, uh, it's we just have to uh, wait and see. We're leaving it up to the membership to decide what path they want to take forward. Yeah, great. Okay, well, Kelsey, I, I know everyone else is very appreciative of you sticking around. I certainly am. Folks, for those of you who don't know, Kelsey is in Washington, D.C. right now, so she's two hours ahead of us. It's getting to be midnight in her, in her time zone, so it's very kind of her to stay up late and give this talk for us. So thanks so much, Kelsey. Really Thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. Okay, I'm going to end our live stream now. Okay. Thanks, thanks for joining us, folks.